My name is Jerry Gill. Today is December 15, 2008. I'm visiting with Dr. Tom Thedford in his home northwest of, of uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this is interviews for the O State Stories Project at the Oklahoma World History Research Program. Uh, Tom, you've had a, a long and, and distinguished career uh, on the faculty at Oklahoma State University in our College of Veterinary Medicine. But I'd like to back up, is that okay with you a little bit, and talk a little bit about your early life. Could you share information maybe about where you grew up, your family, some of the things that influenced your life early on? I was uh, born in uh, Smith County, Tyler, Texas. Mm -hmm. That's eastern Texas, east of Dallas. And uh, we lived on a small farm that my uh, great-grandfather originally mm -hmm. bought, and uh, then my family lived there. And I lived, lived in Tyler. Mm -hmm. Until I was 14 years old on mm -hmm. this small cattle, we had cattle, sheep, mm -hmm. and pigs, and, and uh, just some farming. And, and uh, my dad always worked off the farm as well as the farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been around livestock since I was just, a, I guess, ever since I was born. Mm -hmm. And we we had that farm until I just just uh, when my mother got uh, uh, went into a assisted living facility back in, I don't know, five or six years ago, we sold the place, and, and uh, so it was there. We moved from there then in, uh, to out near, out in the High Plains to Crosbyton, Texas, mm -hmm. and uh, I was in school there one year, mm -hmm. and the next year we rented a farm over north of Lorenzo, Texas, mm -hmm. and uh, this is near the Lubbock area. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I finished high school at uh, Idaloo, which is just east of Lovell. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from there, went off to college, Texas A&M. Uh, six years there, got a bachelor's degree in animal science mm -hmm. and a doctor of veterinary medicine degree from A&M in 1959. Mm -hmm. okay. well, maybe sort of backing up again, Tom, to your early life a little bit. Two things come to my mind. One is it must have been a heck of a change from East Texas out to the High Plains and West Texas. Well, what was the what was the story about the family moving uh, well, that far? The the reason for the move, uh, yeah, it was a big change from fine trees to mm -hmm. to flat nothing almost for miles and miles. Daddy was uh, somewhat of an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that he saw happening was was uh, mechanization of cotton farming mm -hmm. and uh, when John Deere came out with a cotton harvesting machine a stripper cotton stripper mm -hmm. he was one of the first owners of one mm -hmm. and the year before we moved he he went out there and uh, uh, harvested cotton mm -hmm. and with a machine and two men you could harvest up as high as 20 or 25 bales of cotton in a day mm -hmm. whereas it would take uh, five or six people, mm -hmm. two or three days to harvest one bale, and uh, so the that was the reason that he did. That. We got into that business, and the next year we moved out there, and he he wanted to farm in that area, mm -hmm. and he did for a number of years, mm -hmm. and uh, I helped him with the farming, and and uh, we farmed for three or four years, I guess, out there. Yeah. Well, Tom, what? Uh Special influence on you growing up, you know, your parents, or uh, you know, what, what some values that you learned that uh, you took with you the rest of your life. Well, I think probably uh, my my family was uh, it, we had a big family. I had four sisters, and uh, mm -hmm. I was the oldest and the only son. Mm -hmm. So probably one of the biggest things that I got impressed on me very early was. I had to look out for my little sisters and, mm -hmm. and uh, the responsibility of doing that and the responsibility of farming. When uh, while we were in East Texas, when I was nine years old, Daddy was drafted into the uh, military during World War II. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, we had, uh, oh, he had about 500 head of hogs on feed and, mm -hmm. and had uh, about 50 or 60 head of cattle. and, and uh, we had to sell the hogs because there wasn't any way a nine-year-old could take care of them. But I continued taking care of the cattle while he was gone, mm -hmm. and he uh, he wasn't in the, he wasn't in the navy, and he was had so many dependents mm -hmm. with five children at that time. Uh, 
as soon as the war was over, this was in 1944, I guess, when he went in, and uh, as soon as the war was over, he was one of the first ones to get discharged mm -hmm. and uh, sent on back home. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I learned hard work and, and responsibility at a very early age, uh, primarily because of having to take care of this stuff. Started milking cows when I was, I don't know, four or five years old. Mm -hmm. It was my responsibility to see them milked every day. And <laughs> you, had to grow, you had to grow up fast, didn't you, that, yeah, that one year your father was gone? Wow, mercy. Thank you. Uh, so, kind of your, did your undergraduate studies at College Station at, uh, at Texas A&M? Yep. Uh, what do you remember about your undergraduate experience there? I, I'm oh, sure was, you, were in the, you were in the Corps, right? Right. <laughs> First two years, mandatory Corps, mm -hmm. and uh, it was one of the best experiences I ever had in my life. Uh -huh. uh, it was tough. It, mm -hmm. was, it was it was hard to uh, you, had, you had to do some more fast growing up, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I was just 17 when I went down there, uh -huh. and uh, I was just a little old bitty guy, weighed about 130 pounds, I think. And first semester, I, I grew about three inches and put on about 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good experience, but uh, the core. I've thought many times, I think, that, that probably uh, was the thing that, that really developed my ability to study and my ability to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get much, very many challenges in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, high school was very easy. Mm -hmm. I was just in high school three years. I'd have, I skipped my junior year in high school because I had enough credits to graduate. Mm -hmm with one, lacking one, that was English, so I took it by correspondence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never was really challenged in high school. And uh, I got down there, believe me, I got challenged in a hurry. <laughs> about, about learning and time management both, wasn't it? You know, I never even had a science course, except just general science mm -hmm. in, in, in high school. And I was going into veterinary medicine and chemistry, and uh, I had to buckle down and get with it in a hurry. And that was the good thing about the core. Uh, you were required. We had what they call four point call to quarter CQ, mm -hmm. and uh, every night at seven o'clock, uh, you sit at your desk with uh, well, I had not four point six point. You had four four chair legs and your two feet on the floor, and you had to have a book open in front of you, and you sat there from seven till ten. You couldn't even get up unless you had permission to. And at 10, you had 30 minutes to go take a shower and get ready for bed and be in bed by 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, you was up at 6.30 and on with the rest of the day. But, you know, if you're sitting there, <laughs> you might as well be studying. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No radio uh, mm -hmm. and no television. Of course, didn't even have television yeah. then. But, mm -hmm. uh, had to be quiet. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even talk to your roommate. Mm -hmm. You had to sit there, and it was that was study time. Mm -hmm. It taught me to study. Well, Tom, did did you know when you went to to, to a and that you wanted to be a vet? And, and if so, where, where did that come from? Well, yes, it did. I, I, that was one of the. I, I guess I'd always enjoy. My my mother used to love telling stories. She, I don't know if they were true or not. But she said I used to shoot birds with BB gun and then try to treat them to make them well. Now that was her story. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when we uh, uh, I always enjoyed working with livestock, mm -hmm. and, and that's and I, we always had cats and dogs around the place, and and uh, it was usually my responsibility to help take care of some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when I was when we lived at Crosbyton, after we moved to West <coughs> Texas, one of the people there that uh, was very influential uh, in my development was Dr. Bill Romain, who was the local veterinarian. And I would sometimes make some calls with him, and he'd come out to our place to look at our cows or horses or whatever, you know. And after I, when I got into school, when I started out in school, I, I had a, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship. Mm -hmm. It was a Sears Roebuck scholarship, ah. entering freshman in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in agriculture, and the pre-vet curriculum and the animal science curriculum were almost lockstep. Mm -hmm. It was actually animal husbandry at that time, I guess they called it. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I had that for one year, that scholarship, and, and so I did my pre-veterinary work that way. And, mm -hmm. and then I got the animal science degree uh, by doing additional work 
mm. with my veterinary curriculum. And, and did, the both degrees have been very useful. Did, did you go uh, two years in your pre-vet program at that year, time? Then when you went into veterinary school? Four-year vet school. Mm. Yes. Yes, I was lucky I got in after two years. Well, so could you share a little bit about uh, uh, your professional career before you come to Oklahoma State University? So you graduated from vet school at A&M in what year? In 1959. 1959. And I immediately went to work as a, a private veterinarian mm -hmm. for uh, Santa Gertrudis and Quarter Horse Ranch at Waco. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for uh, about six months. And uh, that was not what I thought it was going to be. And mm -hmm. uh, we had a little disagreement. And I decided the best thing for me to do was move on. Mm -hmm. And there's a little professional thing and they asked me to do some things that I didn't think was uh, honest and, mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't do them legally and uh, I had responsibility to the state of Texas and my colleagues and mm -hmm. so I decided that wasn't a place for me and, and I left there and went into practice in Floyd Ada, Texas mm -hmm. and this was a general practice everything mm -hmm. regardless of snakes to elephants you know whatever came across the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, did most probably about 60% uh, of my work was, was uh, food animals mm -hmm. and cattle and sheep and a few goats. Mm -hmm. A little bit of horse work and 30-40% mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. uh, dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. And I was there for all, almost six years. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, how did you how did you hear about the, the opening at, at Oklahoma State University? You, you came here in 65? 65. 65 right? So December how did you 65. find out about the, about the job? And, and well, could you tell us a little bit about the recruiting happened, process? I had one daughter at that mm -hmm. point, and mm -hmm. my wife was expecting her second child. And uh, I mm -hmm. came home one day from work, and it dawned on me that uh, even though my clinic was right next door to my house, mm -hmm that I had not seen my coming four-year-old daughter awake in over two weeks. Mm -hmm. I left before she got up. If I came in during the day, she was usually taking a nap, and then I didn't get through working until she'd gone to bed. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, self, there's got to be a better way of making a living than this. Mm -hmm. So I decided to uh, uh, seek employment somewhere else, something different. Mm -hmm. and, and I had two or three options. Uh, one option, I, I, I filled out the papers for a commission in the Air Force, mm -hmm. which is the second time I'd done that. <laughs> the first time I went out to work for this ranch, got offered that job and didn't go. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mail these for a few days and, and I, I mailed out some papers to uh, looked at government employment and I wrote Texas A&M, uh, Kansas State University, Missouri, University of Missouri and Oklahoma State University inquiring by job. And Oklahoma State was the only one that had a job opening at that time and they agreed to interview me if I would come up. And I did. Uh, the job was uh, in the small animal clinic as a small animal clinician mm. and uh, I decided that uh, that would be okay. So I sold my clinic, uh, loaded up my, this was, I had both daughters at that time, mm -hmm. in the interim, the second one had been born, mm -hmm. and loaded up the kids and my wife and we moved to Stillwater. Well, uh, who was, let's see, who was Dean at that time? Uh, Dean was, uh, just a minute, uh, Holmes, was it? Holmes, Holmes? yeah, Glenn Holmes, mm -hmm. yes. The guy that hired me was Gene uh, Jones, who was a small animal clinician there. And Wiley Wolf was the department head. Okay. Uh, interesting combination mm -hmm. of people. Well, I was going to ask you, as I understand, your career took you more large animal than in, in, in uh, food animal mm -hmm. practice. So so your first teaching assignment, though, was in small, small what animal? What happened? <laughs> yeah, can you kind of share how that you know, how you finally got over in large animal? Well, at the, uh, I came here in December, and uh, along toward uh, the end of, uh, well, I guess it was in June uh, of 66, Dr. Lewis Moe, who was one of the original faculty members here at the college uh, and was the ambulatory clinician, the farm services clinician, made calls out in the country and treated animals out there. Dr. Moe retired. Dr. Wolf called me one day and asked me would I be interested in taking that job. And that was more 
to my liking than, mm -hmm. than the small landlord. I enjoyed working with the small landlord, but mm -hmm. it didn't like being inside. Mm -hmm. So I took that job, and um, in September, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. I moved into the large. And well, actually, that's not totally true. That summer, uh, Dr. Jones, who was a small animal uh, man, broke his foot. He couldn't work. Dr. Acre, who was the other small animal clinician, uh, left and took a uh, job in practice in mm -hmm. Midwest City. So I was the only small animal clinician left. Uh, simultaneously, with the Guatemala contract that was going on, mm -hmm. yeah. with uh, uh, AID, USAID, Dr. Uh, Williams and Dr. Johnson were both sent down to Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two people that were in the clinic had gone to other jobs. Mm -hmm. So in the mornings, I ran the small animal clinic. Mm -hmm. A new graduate, Dr. T uh, Dr. Taylor was his name, mm -hmm. did the some of the large animal mm -hmm. work, and I did the ambulatory in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. So it was two of us running the clinic wow. for this summer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might not have had much time to see your daughters that, that summer either, did you? Them either <laughs> then. But then in September, mm -hmm. when uh, we had full staff at that point, and uh, uh, things leveled out. Well, Tom, what can you recall uh, a little bit of what the facilities were like and equipment when you got there in '65? <laughs> <laughs> well, they were better than I had in practice, but they're still pretty, pretty, uh, pretty crude in many respects. We had, we had uh, pretty good working shoots for for livestock. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one big old surgery table, and, and we had the infamous wrestling mat that we used most of the time. Well, well tell, tell me a bit about that. I, we were sharing earlier, off, you know, off camera that uh, Dr. Lester had visited a little bit about that, but they had the large operating table, as I understood it. It, was, it, it didn't tilt, didn't have, you know, you couldn't move it up and down, so it was difficult getting large animals on it. So you, Well, it would tilt over, mm -hmm. but you couldn't do anything, it just went flat. Uh -huh, and, okay. it, and you had to, had to strap the animals to it before you laid them down. Mm -hmm. well, they didn't like that. Too much. <laughs> and, and it wasn't hydraulic. So yeah, it, was, well, it was hydraulic, but it was it was a it was a slow moving thing, mm -hmm. and you had to get them tied mm -hmm. where they couldn't jump off of it, mm -hmm. and you couldn't anesthetize them standing. So in many times, it was just much simpler just to anesthetize them, let them collapse onto the wrestling mat, which was I don't know three inches thick mm -hmm. or so. It was I may not have been that thick, but it was thick. And, and they could lay on it, and it wouldn't put pressure on their nerves. It didn't cause paralysis to the animals, and it was so much easier on our knees. So let me, let me try to get this picture here, Tom. I mean, you were talking about this, say, uh, say, large cow, okay? So get down, this is a wrestling mat, I mean, literally, that you probably, I guess, cleaned up, sterilized, yeah. and laid them on the mat. Yeah. So you're, you're down there on your hands and knees yeah. operating on this cow. Yeah. Well, what was some of the what was some of the trials and tribulations of that kind of surgery? Well, it was it wasn't too bad. Uh, you know, it'd been better if you'd be standing. That was awful hard on your back after a while. Your knees got kind of tired, but uh, you learned to be pretty efficient and try to get through it a little faster. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and and then it was always the the job of of uh, as soon as you got them up, you know, as soon as you got them awake and got them back on their on their feet. And, moved off then you had to clean the mat right mm -hmm. quick for them. the gore got dry and you had mm -hmm. trouble getting it clean but it worked it was a pretty good system <laughs> yeah i've heard the expression you know go to the mat but never thought about it in terms of operating <laughs> on an animal <laughs> it's a great story uh, well what who were some of the key uh, key faculty you, you mentioned some names earlier but when you you came there and, and then my sort of follow that up with uh, what, what did you remember about some of those uh, early faculty members well, the department head was Dr. Wiley Wolf. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Wolf was an Iowa uh, uh, native, but did his veterinary work at Texas A&M, mm -hmm. and and he was one of the most unique individuals I ever knew. He was he was uh, he was department head, and uh, the man was he was everywhere. He mm -hmm. always knew what was going on, mm -hmm. and, and you 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 you'd see him sitting in his office, and you'd think you know if somebody walk in, they'd think uh, this guy probably. Uh, it doesn't ever get out of that office, but he knew exactly what was going on everywhere all of the time. He was a really unique guy, very nice guy, very fair and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, upfront. 
he believed in teaching and uh, he, he wanted you to do your teaching and, and take care of the students and he, he told me when I came up here he said he said go to the meetings learn new material teach the students do your job and I'll take care of you and that's what he did he was a good man some of the others was uh, Dr. Newton to Neil was our radiologist mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we always laughed about it laughed at Newton and we'd tease him about being an old bear because he was back in kind of a dark place and he'd come out of his cave growling you know <laughs> he was a neat guy uh, and uh, he, he uh, took care of the uh, radiology mm -hmm. stuff uh, Lester Johnson was our large animal clinic head and, 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 and an absolute gentleman, one of the most uh, uh, gentle and nice and, and professional people I've ever known in my life and uh, had a long and, and a very uh, deep friendship that continues to this day. Uh, he's a fantastic veterinarian and, and, and just a gentleman too. Uh, another one was Dr. Eric Williams, mm -hmm. who was, a, yes. was yeah. a, uh, an immigrant from Wales, mm -hmm. and uh, he was he was always everywhere doing everything. And, and uh, another, we, I had some exceptionally good veterinarians mm -hmm. that I was able to work with and learn from in the mm -hmm. process of coming here. I was, I was fairly young. And, I was very young. I was, I guess, I was 29 when I came here, and uh, I got a lot of a good uh, experience. Learned a lot from these guys. They were good people. Tom, what about personalities? And there had to be some characters on the faculty there. One or yeah. two you can recall uh, some stories you have there. Newton Daniel was certainly a character. He was he was uh, he was a, a, a good one. Let's see who else. Uh, we had a lot of people come in and go out. I, I, we we've always mm -hmm. I've always said that it's. It's amazing that the number of very famous people that have come through Oklahoma State University College of Veterinary Medicine, you know, they, they come here and they, uh, we, we give them some training and then they move on somewhere else. And, and uh, uh, I can't think, we've had... Mm -hmm. This guy just thought something stood out in your mind, you might... No, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. Well, Tom, <clears throat> kind of back to your specialty. Uh, you know, yours especially have been, uh, been sort of a large animal, but also uh, you were department head, I know, one time, I think, of surgery and medicine. Is that right? Well, no. Actually, I was, uh, well, let me just give you a little run through there. Yeah. I, I was ambulatory clinician for nine years. And then that's where you, you said earlier you go out. Go and out and take care of the take farm, care of, 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 farm of, calls and, mm -hmm. and uh, usually herd medicine. Occasionally, you know, we do some individual animals, mm -hmm. but a lot of herd medicine, mm -hmm. herd work. And then in uh, 1974, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, join Colorado State mm -hmm. with the USAID program in uh, Kenya, in Nairobi, to, at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Nairobi. I actually was on loan from OSU, so I never actually left the mm -hmm. uh, protection or auspices of, of Oklahoma State. I was just loan to Colorado. Mm -hmm. They paid OSU, OSU paid me. And I was there for two years. And then when I came back... Tom, can I just... So, can you tell us a little bit about what you did there, some of your experiences in Nairobi? Sure. sounds pretty fascinating. It was very fascinating. I, again, at, at when I got there, mm -hmm. I, I taught uh, infectious diseases like I had mm -hmm. right here in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. And I was the head of the ambulatory clinic. Mm -hmm. And and that was the primary way that uh, we saw livestock was mm -hmm. go to the farms mm -hmm. because many of these people not, nobody had transportation mm -hmm. and uh, and we again we was working primarily with food animals that was my so what would there have been some domestic animals you worked with there in oh, addition yeah, we think of totally. cattle so that's what? all I worked with was domestic animals mm -hmm. so what kind of you just cattle primarily cattle hogs mm -hmm. uh, sheep goats. Yeah. Uh, did a little bit of horse work. Most of the horses were owned by uh, uh, Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, the Africans primarily had donkeys, mm -hmm. and uh, and we worked. I worked with with the Africans. It was it was. I had uh, as an ambulatory clinician. I had we'd have vehicles and used old Land Rovers. Mm -hmm. I had a driver 
guide interpreter. Mm -hmm. He served in all three purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, a very nice guy named Gitao Kihara. Mm -hmm. And Gitao was my, uh, uh, he was my right hand as well as my teacher in many mm -hmm. cases. I'll tell you a funny story about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we would go out to the villages and treat the animals. And many, many times these villagers would walk in to tell us they had a sick animal. They didn't have transportation for themselves even. It may take them all day to walk in there and we'd go out the next day to see the sick animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd, we'd go out and treat cattle and, and uh, we had some pig farms that were primarily uh, owned by Europeans for the mm -hmm. most part. And, uh, but all of the villagers had uh, cows mm -hmm. and, and sheep and goats. Okay. And, and cows is what I sp probably spent most of I just had in my mind that you might be taking care of some more exotic animals. You know, right? that was, that's <clears throat> the only exotic thing that I touched other than my, uh, I, I did a lot of hunting while I was over there mm -hmm. and, and game watching and that kind of stuff. But uh, the only exotic animal I treated was the game department brought a warthog up one day and they <laughs> wanted to know if there's anybody knew how to get a blood sample from this warthog. Well, I bled hogs all my life. I mean, you know, from all my professional career, I said, sure, I can do that. So I went out and I drew this blood sample from this warthog and they were all impressed with that. And <laughs> that's the only time I touched one of these animals in a medical sense in the two years that I was there. Yes, but mostly it was teaching students. So you have a story about your your interpreter and your driver. When I first first when I first got there, you know, like most uh, graduates of most veterinary schools, when you when you when you're going through your curriculum and they start telling you about these exotic diseases that we don't have in this country, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of turn it off. You don't listen real good. Mm -hmm. And I got over there and we went out on this call and. And we had this cow. Oh, she was sick. She was so sick. And I didn't have a clue what was the matter with mm her. -hmm. And good old Gatow, he was helping me along. He went around, he, he pulled her tongue out of her mouth, and he turned it over. And he says, uh, Dr. Thedford said, are these little blood spots, little petechiae on the bottom of this tongue? And I looked over there, and I said, why, yes, Gatow, those sure are. And he walked around, and he pushed a big and large lymph node in, in front of her shoulder up and he said, uh, do you think, that is, is this lymph node possibly enlarged? And I says, why yes, good tell, that's curious. And all this time we had four or five students standing around, you know, watching us and talking to us. And, and we did two or three other things like that and him giving me the clues. And finally he said, <laughs> he said, do you suppose this could be East Coast fever? And I said, good tell, I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I made my first well, diagnosis the of the East Coast <laughs> exactly. fever right there with the able <laughs> assistance of the uh, uh, <laughs> Well, Tom did mean to get you decided right. You were talking about kind of your, I think you were talking about your career and how it evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had had your uh, uh, experience in Kenya and then, and then from there. Back to Oklahoma State. Mm -hmm. At that time I was back on ambulatory. And uh, I had an ambulatory clinic from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And at that particular point in time, I was also put 50% mm -hmm. extension. Mm -hmm. So I was extension veterinarian mm -hmm. for the state of Oklahoma from 5 o'clock in the afternoon to 8 o'clock the next morning. Ah. Those people like to work me to death. After a year of that, <laughs> Bill Taggart was head of the extension department. Mm -hmm. and. and uh, Bill Brock was our, our dean mm -hmm. at that time. And I, I met with both of them and I said, told them, I said, gentlemen, I don't care what you do, but get me out of this mess. You know, you can make me all extension, or you can make me all clinic, or 90% one or the other, but get off of this 50-50 thing, it's about to kill me. So they got together and they agreed. And, and when, after a year, then I became the extension veterinarian and I was, 90% uh, extension, 10% clinics. For the state of Oklahoma. For the state Special of contract, probably into different sources of funds and everything. Well, it? yeah, this mm -hmm. was uh, federal mm -hmm. funds right. for a whole lot of it. And uh, so then I, that was when I started into the extension program. Mm -hmm. uh, 
all 77 counties. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd go out and give programs for the farmers and, and work with them, work with veterinarians on, on special cases and that kind of stuff. Yeah, Tom, I was going to ask you a question to your, your others. How is that different than a practicing or a teaching veterinarian? I mean, the, you're, you're in different kinds of activities and services. Could you share a little bit more? You said you went out and, and, and visited it was practitioners. A, it was still teaching, mm -hmm. but it was mostly teaching farmers how to use but utilize veterinary service and mm -hmm. how to... Uh, my, my primary goal was to teach these guys to recognize disease, to mm -hmm. recognize their animals early enough mm -hmm. and get intervention by a veterinarian early enough to get some results. You know, the last thing you want to do is uh, bring in one that's going to die in 24 hours and ask the vet to try to save it because it's mm -hmm. not going to work. Right. But if you can look at this thing, and, and the other thing that was going on at that particular time was we were in the throes of brucellosis eradication, Bang's disease. Mm -hmm. And I worked with uh, uh, the uh, Winrock International over in Arkansas, mm -hmm. and I worked with the uh, uh, Oil Foundation uh, down at uh, Poto. Uh, Kerr Foundation. Kerr Foundation. Mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. The Kerr Foundation. And we put together, and I was the, the spokesman, in a, a videotape mm -hmm. to use for, for to, to tell farmers about brucellosis and the cost and what it could do and what we could do and, what we, and how the program ran. And mm -hmm. this was a national program. Mm -hmm. uh, that videotape was used all across the South uh, mm -hmm. in all the states that were having problems with brucellosis at that time as an educational thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually led up to a, a, a job that I took later with Winrock International. Mm -hmm. And uh, you took it, was it, took a leave absence for a year? Is that right? Took a leave program? absence for a year mm -hmm. and went over and worked with them and, and uh, did a bunch of educational programs for them and put together, I wrote two books. Mm -hmm. It was part of, as I recall, were you in Haiti? It was part of, yes, was part of that. I was in Haiti. Mm -hmm. It was down in Haiti for a while with that. Took some, we sent a bunch of goats down there, and, and uh, I went over to meet the goats and, mm -hmm. and get them off the plane and get them out to uh, the little town of Hinch, which is way out in the center of, mm -hmm. the, of the country. And it was interesting. We brought these goats in. They were just pretty good kind of dairy goats, you know. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we had people walk in 50 miles to see these big goats. They couldn't believe how big they were <laughs> because they uh, any goat that got big enough, the bigger the goat, the quicker it got eaten. Mm -hmm. They'd slaughter it, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so it was kind of a, a natural reverse selection process and they were selecting for smaller goats all the time. These goats, some of them wasn't over 18, 20 inches tall. Oh, my mature gosh. Mature goats. You know? uh -huh. And uh, so that, that was an interesting Thing. That was kind of an offshoot that came out of that. But I was an extension veterinarian for 20 some years. Did, 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 did you get them to wait long enough there in Haiti to get to grow <laughs> larger goats? Did, did that work? We hoped that these other, I don't know. We, <laughs> we left those goats down there. I was just down there two or three weeks. And, mm -hmm. and uh, then I came back home and uh, uh, we had them in a, in a program there that they were trying to get people to mm -hmm. get more. Mm -hmm. Well, we were looking at we were looking at the standpoint of more bigger goats have have more meat, and in fact, dairy goats for milk. Mm -hmm. One of the very unusual things about the Haitian people at that particular time—I don't know if that's still the case or not—but they believed that if you fed goats milk to boy babies, that they would not develop their manhood properly. They would somehow or other it, it uh -huh. influenced them to where they would not. So they wouldn't give their boy children huh? goat's milk. But they would give the girl children goat's milk. And the poor little things, they all needed some kind of nutrition. nutrition. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of the projects that they were trying to get these people to do. It was interesting to see mm -hmm. weird ideas that people get. Tom, you said, I mean, 19 years, do you say? Earlier you were in extension. It was in about 22 years. 22 actually. years. Mm -hmm. Now, were you 90% during that time? The whole time. The whole time. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of your career then was spent in, in, in extension. extension. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, I, uh, well, 
I was an extension veterinarian, did all these programs, worked around the mm -hmm. state, going out to visit with farmers and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. And usually it was night programs where we get together, kind of working with the county mm -hmm. extension agents. And uh, then in 88, I was asked to uh, interview for a job with Kansas State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was accepted as a as a person to go up there to go and I went to Botswana in Southern Africa for two years. And this was another one of those deals just like the other one. I was on loan from Oklahoma State to Kansas State. And uh, there I was doing primarily research in goat disease and mm -hmm. goat problems. So And Tom, where was this again? This was in Botswana. Botswana. Botswana, B O T S W A N A. Just uh, north of uh, South Just Africa. North of South Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Used to be uh, Betuana land. I think back in the days when I went to school, you know, and uh, it's it was a it's a it's a high dry plateau. It's part of the uh, uh, of a desert, a huge desert, a Kalahari mm -hmm. desert, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was very very dry. They, they raised a lot of cattle, and but goats are the primarily uh, primary meat and milk source for the people. Mm -hmm. And I was working with, with them. And how long were you there? Two years. Two years? Mm -hmm. A little over two years, actually about two wow. years. You've had months. some pretty incredible experiences, Tom. Oh, yeah. My different places. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, did, you know, from there, did you, did, did you then get back into teaching and research then later in your career out of extension? When I came back, mm -hmm. when I came back, I, uh, Dr. Joe Alexander was the dean then, and uh, while I was over there, he wrote and asked me if I would come back and, and, and be the assistant dean for outreach. Mm -hmm. So in that uh, respect, I had uh, charge of not only extension, and I was doing a lot of the extension work myself, but uh, other the whole extension program, mm -hmm. continuing education, mm -hmm. alumni affairs, that's where I got met you, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also uh, some development, worked with development with John Cathy, mm -hmm. and uh, I was that until I, until I retired. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing back in my back of in that interim in there between the time I left, uh, I got back from One Rock International and went to Botswana, mm -hmm. one of the things that we did here was uh, develop a uh, satellite mediated educational program for veterinarians right. and we did I think three or four or five of those and we broadcast those things all over the United States mm -hmm. and, and uh, they were really really mm -hmm. successful and mm -hmm. as a matter of fact uh, one of my colleagues mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Louis Spratton who mm -hmm. is retired mm -hmm. now and lives over in Cookson uh, told me the other day and I didn't hadn't realized this didn't know it but he wrote a letter to the American Association of Extension veterinarians, telling them what I'd done in this educational thing, and they they were aware of it too, and mm -hmm. recommending me for uh, an honor, and I was uh, given the Extension Veterinarian of the Year award in uh, eighty nine. So national. It was national. National. So national Extension but Veterinarian of the year. the year. Wow, that's pretty high uh, and, honor, uh, isn't it? It was very, it was very nice. Great. And what year was it? And I was in, I was in Africa during that time. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. secretary accepted, and went down to San Antonio at the Avian uh, American Veterinary Medical Association meeting, and accepted the award on, on my behalf. Great. But we we did some good things. We did some neat stuff on that. And so the teleconferencing, there'd be several hundred participants in that. That yeah. they would be nationwide, nationwide right? Nationwide, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we had the videotape that people could check out and look mm -hmm. at, and uh, and these were usually most of them were about four hours long. I mean, you know, we do two two well, hours. Most of the people would time be practitioners. Practitioners were, in this case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, you were active throughout your career, as you said, with practitioners and, and alumni relations, and that's where you know you and I first met. Uh, can you tell me about some of your activities? Uh, on campus and off campus, uh, in addition to what you talked about in, in terms of working with practitioners, uh, what were some of the things that you, that you did? Did you did you consult? Did you put on some conferences we talked about that you yeah. did? Uh, did you uh, go out and speak? I and mean, what are what were some of the activities surrounding that? 
Well, one of the things we did was, was uh, back years ago, we used to have what we called our, our annual OSU conference. Mm. And, and then there was a period of time when, when we didn't have it. I, I don't remember what the reason for doing it, but there was a, a need to do it. And, and I started that thing mm. back up again. And we had our fall conference for veterans, Oklahoma State Fall Conference for Veterans, which still goes on today. Mm -hmm. uh, we reinstituted that, and, and what we would do is we would bring uh, uh, nationally known speakers mm -hmm. into the state, so our practitioners didn't have to go out of state to, to learn mm -hmm. from them. And it was usually a two-day conference. It still is two to three-day conference, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it, it grew tremendously. We went from 150 people to we get four or 500 now, I think. It's, it's, it's really great. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things. Uh, I, I continued with the farm programs that we'd go out on the, to, mm -hmm. to the counties and give to the farmers. Uh, one other thing we did was uh, I developed a, a, a teleconferencing type thing that we used telephone. And I would would put together uh, sets of slides mm -hmm. with a narrative, mm -hmm. and I could mail these slides out to several county extension mm -hmm. people, and then we'd get a conference call set up, mm -hmm. and I would sit in my office here in Stillwater and lecture to three or four counties simultaneously over mm -hmm. this conference call. Mm -hmm. And then we could take questions from each of these county extension directors back in, and then I could answer them. And, and, and they'd be viewing slides, same set of slides you were looking at. I was looking at a set of slides, and, and they were looking at the same set. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, uh, Tom, in your mind, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you represented the College of Veterinary Medicine uh, in your relationships with alumni, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, then, and then even served as representative of the mm -hmm. College of, of Veterinary Medicine on the Oklahoma State University Alumni Association. Can you share with us a little bit about what you think, uh, you know, how important good relationships are with, with alumni and, and, and perhaps what you think is the, the important role the alumni can play? I, I, that was one of the more mm -hmm. very stimulating and very frustrating sometimes mm -hmm. uh, to try to, to, to keep these alumni relations going. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the important things to do is to recognize, uh, try to get to our, our alumni the fact that so many of the, uh, we've, got, we've got people from our college that have gone out in, and done national and international things. I mean, they, these people are, are well trained mm -hmm. and they do great and glorious things. And a lot of times I think our local people, they go back to the county or the, the city that they came from and they are not exposed as much to these other folks and they, and they, and they tend to have a little less kind of an inferiority complex, mm -hmm. I guess. And I think we need to build that, mm -hmm. that strengthen that, that knowledge that, uh, hey, Oklahoma State did a good job for you and, and you did a good mm -hmm. job for them. And, and between the two of you, you learned a lot and they, They've benefited from having you there, and any time we can build this kind of a thing, and that was, that was what I tried to do. I'd go out and talk with these these alumni groups, and and we'd have a uh, at the, at the fall conference we always had an alumni meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd have reunions of the classes come in, and we and, and we'd have a uh, every five years or however many that had been out that we'd have their reunions if they wanted to have them. And we'd put them to my office. We'd put the reunions together and, and we'd do that. And it was it was very important to do that. And I think I think it helps. Tom, I recall you also had a you know like a distinguished uh, uh, alumnus award, also as part of your re, you know your reunions or your annual meeting, whichever that was. Yes, we had we started having our distinguished alumni awards, and we would have mm -hmm. usually it was one of the older classes mm -hmm. that we would get the nominations from, and then we would would honor those people. Mm -hmm. And that's still going on today too. When uh, when I went to visit with with uh, uh, Dr. Joe Alexander, you know, former dean mm -hmm. of college, he talked about the importance of relationships in in uh, I think in two or three powerful ways that you might speak to. One is of course that help with fundraising, 
but he said as often as not they would connect you with someone else, I mean a corporation, another individual, and, uh, an owner mm -hmm. uh, that, that didn't have a, a relationship or degree you know, with Oklahoma State University. It was important in creating and them helping the network out there, helping create relationships, help with fundraising, and then bringing you know, business to the college. Is that, is that your perception That's, as well? Yes, it was, <clears throat> that was one of the more important things I think that, that uh, this alumni relations did. Uh, one example was uh, one of our early graduates um, knew this this gentleman, uh, uh, Mr. Sidlington, and uh, uh, this guy was a farmer. Uh, he had a little farm, a little dairy farm, and uh, uh, the vet brought him over here, showed him the college, showed him the, what we could do, and and. Uh, it, the vet school and, and uh, animal science department, and, and this guy was very impressed with that. And, mm. and when he passed away, he left uh, something like two and a half, three million dollars, maybe four. I don't know. It was a bunch of money. Mm. And uh, half of it went to the College of Agriculture, and half of it went to the College of Veterinary wow. Medicine. And this guy never—I mm. don't even know if he graduated from high school. Mr. Sellington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we've got two chairs mm. yeah. that. This wow. funded in addition to some scholarships, I think, but that's where uh, if and this has been repeated innumerable times, many times. times since since I retired that we've had uh, someone that uh, a veterinarian knew that wanted to do something charitable, mm -hmm. and they'd come to the vet and say, "Can you suggest something?" And when they suggest Oklahoma State University, well, that's that makes a difference. that's a good deal. That's a difference. That's what happens? Right. What uh, Tom? You've had a very varied. I mean, all the way from teaching to extension to research. Uh, uh, what? Uh, you know, in these areas of your professional career, which have given you the most personal satisfaction? Oh, that's easy. It was teaching. Teaching. Yeah, I love to teach. I enjoy the students. I enjoy teaching them, and, and uh, that's been the, that's been my my biggest thing. I was lucky enough to uh, one year win the, the Norton Award for teaching. Outstanding and, teaching. Uh, outstanding teacher award. Norton yeah. Award. Do you remember yeah. what year that was? Oh. I can't remember. It was, Way back. It was, it, it was back there a ways, mm -hmm. and uh, that was that was a that was a, a great thing. Mm -hmm. It was a fine thing. I really enjoyed that, and uh, I I still teach. I, I have one little course I teach. It's a two-hour course in mm -hmm. you know, a small room in medicine and surgery. I teach mm -hmm. uh, sheep, goats, and, and llamas, and I do that in the spring each mm -hmm. year. And it's it's an elective, and yeah. and. Uh, this coming year, I've got uh, 53 or four students signed up for it, which I think is pretty good. Now, uh, llamas is a hobby of yours, right? Yes. You, you own how many llamas now? Got 19 now. 19. And how many years have you been in the llama business? Oh, since '84. So you, you're probably, in probably an expert time. in llamas, then, aren't you? <laughs> I've and, messed with them a long time. And don't you got some goats as got well? Some goats. Yeah, this year got some goats. I got some goats this <laughs> year to uh -huh. eat some brush up around here, but that, that's just. <laughs> I like I like I like goats. I, like, I used to raise sheep. I, at one time, I raised res, registered Suffolk sheep. So uh, the small run thing, I've been involved in pretty heavy for a number of years. Great. What uh, you know, maybe back in uh, up maybe thirty thousand feet and get a kind of larger view. Uh, how uh, how's the college in your mind, Tom, changed over the years? You know, forty to nearly fifty years you've been. Well, when I came here. Uh, we had a maximum of 48 students. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, I think it was seven states that we took students from, contract states. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have very many Okies came in. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we would have one, maybe two girls per class. Mm -hmm. uh, probably 60, 70 percent of the students were going into food animals or large animals, horses or cattle or mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. this type of thing. Uh, today, we have uh, at least, uh, I think it's got to be like 80% mm -hmm. by state statute Oklahoma graduates mm -hmm. or Oklahoma residents, mm -hmm. which is good. Mm -hmm. um, about 
seventy percent female. Wow. About uh, ten percent, maybe at best, mm -hmm. are going into food animals or large animals, food animals. Mm -hmm. it, it's been an almost complete reversal. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I'm qualified to say whether it's better or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it, it's certainly different. Mm -hmm. it's certainly a different situation. Um, I think we have a real problem trying to get more food animal people into uh, that area now. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take some special efforts to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's harder work and it's not quite as rewarding as a small animal. There's so many more things that uh, they can do with uh, dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. Practice a uh, higher quality medicine. They refer to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, it's in, in its primary, they're in their in their uh, facilities. Yeah, and then they're not going out. Yeah, and they, and they can do um, all kinds of lab tests, and they can do all kinds of, of, of uh, diagnostic imaging and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it, it just gets too expensive on the mm -hmm. food animals. You know, and that's one of the things that I enjoy about teaching this course that I teach. I, I try to teach it from two standpoints. I teach it from the standpoint of production animal medicine, or you know, you got a herd of goats or sheep out here, and you're and you're you're raising them for for meat and fiber, mm -hmm. and you have to pay attention to the price that these are the value of these animals mm -hmm. in your diagnostics and your workup. You also have pet goats and sheep, mm -hmm. and the fact that in many cases, money's not an object there. They want that animal saved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas if that were a production animal, they would say, we need to sacrifice it to find out so we can protect the rest of them. Yeah. And, and I try to cover both of these angles and try to, to mm -hmm. get them to understand that there is a difference and it's their responsibility, the veterinarian's responsibility to determine what he's going to do or, or what she's going to do, where are you going, how are you going to handle these cases. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you, uh, what kind of alternatives do you alternative to give to your you clients? Have, right. Mm -hmm. you sometimes you have to. You sometimes you have to give them several alternatives, mm -hmm. and some of them may not be the best quality medicine mm -hmm. under the circumstances. Well, Tom, what what have been some uh, what have been some significant milestones, uh, significant achievements of the college uh, during your tenure? Oh, probably the biggest and greatest. Uh, uh, leap forward is a new hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was back, you know, 25 years ago or so. But uh, it, it 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 just totally changed our whole way of doing things. The library is is mm -hmm. many many times better than it was. Um, our facilities are so much better. Our 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 our, our staff numbers have increased. Mm -hmm. um, Our research potential has increased. I, I personally sometimes feel that uh, maybe we've we've. Sometimes I don't think we're doing quite as good a job teaching as we as we used to. Mm -hmm. uh, we've kind of shifted to the research thing a little more, mm -hmm. and and uh, that makes it a little difficult on mm -hmm. some of these kids. I think. And, and uh, a good teacher's hard to find. Mm -hmm. and, and when you get one, you really need to hang on to them. Mm -hmm. and, and if they're a little backward in their research capability, well, mm -hmm. sometimes it's worth ignoring that, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> just to keep that teacher in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, how is... Uh, you talk about changes at Oklahoma State University. In your mind, how has the, the profession, veterinary medicine profession, changed over the years? Well, we have a lot more veterinarians than we used to have. Uh, they do a, uh, a much more complete job. I mean, uh, my goodness, uh, when you th stop and think about uh, we do magnetic uh, MRI or resonance imaging. So we do CAT scans now. And, uh, we have all kinds of, of blood tests and, and things that, that well, when I went through school, these were a dream. You know, we could do an x-ray and right. blood count, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the technology's been changes. The technology's advanced tremendously. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 
So much of the technology advancements that have occurred in veterinary medicine have been precursors to advancement in human medicine. Mm -hmm. they, they, they came through the veterinary uh, channels mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. and then they went into human medicine in many cases. And mm -hmm. So oh, there's been a, a whole lot of changes. And, and, and now there's a change now. They're, they're, they're pushing more towards uh, the concept of one medicine. You know, human, animal, uh, zoonotic problems, meaning that they occur in all species, you mm -hmm. know, whether human or animal. And um, that's a different attitude mm -hmm. that's kind of come up in the last few years. So there's been a lot of changes in the profession, and, and I, think they're, I think for the most part they're good. And I think as you indicated, they're probably the change into more women. Oh yeah, absolutely. Into, yeah. into veterinary medicine, and, and this has been this has had some good effects. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, at the risk of, uh, I don't want to I don't want to sound sexist at all, but um, I, th I think I think the women have made the profession more gentle. They, they have made it uh, more caring in many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, so guys, we were kind of. Crude, rude, and probably socially unacceptable in many cases, but uh, uh, I think there's been some changes, and I think there've been good changes for the most part. Now, uh, one of the kind of maybe not quite so positive things is um, the profession is, to some degree, has advanced more towards a second income profession uh, rather than a primary income profession because of so many women in there. The women are still the ones that. Or the mothers and have the kids, you know, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are are not full time mm -hmm. working in clinics with other doctors. Right, and, it's if they're a part time, maybe mm -hmm. they're part time, or or their children come first, which they should, mm -hmm. you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's a, that's the right thing to do. But it has changed the dynamics, I think, a little mm -hmm. bit, mm -hmm. and it's, it's we we adapted, we took care of that. Uh, Tom, one thing we were talking about here just a minute ago is some of the, the research that for a small, relatively small, say, sort of under-resourced university like uh, ours and, our, and the College of, uh, College of uh, Veterinary Medicine, yeah, we've produced some research that have made millions and millions of dollars of difference in industry. Uh, could you just maybe summarize or share some of those key research contributions that we've made in our well, college? Yeah, one of the, one of the first ones was... Uh Way back there, we were one of the. We, as a matter of fact, had the the, the patent on the only uh, usable, effective anaplasmosis vaccine, mm -hmm. and anaplasmosis was a and still is a a, a major source of loss in lives in cattle, mm -hmm. and that, and that, that vaccine was uh, one of the first ones that that, that came out was the only one for many many years. Which uh, uh, professors were uh, involved in research in that area, do you recall? There's a guy named Cleaver that worked up at uh, Pahuska. Uh, Bill Brock was involved in it. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know who else. Uh, following on that line of uh, blood parasites, which is what that is, mm -hmm. um, Sydney Ewing has, has, has worked with Ehrlichia, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is a parasite primarily of dogs and cats, and, and, and he's done a lot of work in that. Uh, Kathy Kosan and her group there at the college have done a lot of work with tick-borne diseases, mm -hmm. blood parasite tick-borne diseases, mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're, they're just about to come out with a, with a vaccine mm -hmm. in, in that area. It's, a, it's an advancement on the anaplasmosis thing. It's, it's going to be a tremendous amount of value. Tom, some of your research, I know back several years ago, was in wild animal diseases. Uh, did you work in some of those, those areas? I didn't do any actual bench research. You know, most of, the, most of the stuff that I've done has been practical applied type thing. I've mm -hmm. worked with uh, old drug pr approvals or uh, when I was overseas, I was working with production problems and disease problems as far as from a practical aspect. Mm -hmm. I've not been involved in the, the mm -hmm. so-called bench research mm -hmm. to, to any great degree. 
uh, I have I have worked with a number of researchers on other things like Alcosin uh, when, when Al was active here mm -hmm. uh, in research. I worked with him, and we were a pretty good team. He was a good researcher, and I and I had a good practical approach to it. And put the two of us together, uh, we we made some good progress. And what about anaplasmosis? A lot of research we've done in, in that area you mentioned, but then also brucellosis, is that correct? Yeah, and brucellosis, mm -hmm. the main thing I did with that, I didn't, now you know, we've had some people do brucellosis mm -hmm. research here and they've done a good job on that. Uh, they've come up with some new vaccines there, which have been, again, this is large animal uh, mm -hmm. type stuff. Um, my, my, my involvement in that was primarily from an educational standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, making the farmers aware of the costs and, and, the, and the downside of this disease and, and what it would mean to eradicate it and how, how they could benefit from it. And, and that had to be done uh, regardless of how much knowledge we had on, on, on eradicating and preventing the disease because you didn't have the support of the farmers. Uh, it wasn't going to happen. And that's, I spent about probably six or eight years working on that, and, and, that, and that, that had a lot of, we had a lot of good things happen there. Some other things that we've done as far as research in the, the reproductive, we've done some reproductive disease research, has been done in several people, people worked on that. Uh, it's, it's still currently from bovine respiratory disease, there's, a, there's been a world of research done on that. Uh, Tony Comfort, Bob Fulton, Bob Smith's been involved in it. Uh, there's a whole, you know, these are the ones I just pull off the top of my head, but there's a, there's been a big effort in bovine respiratory disease research. And uh, worked with Bob Fulton on blue tongue uh, back some years ago. I've, I've been kind of, mm -hmm. where I fit into these, these research mm -hmm. things, I've kind of been a footman. I've worked with the farmers, and I've worked with the, uh, hey, uh, going out and working with livestock on the situation. They're kind of the brains up in the brawn, I guess you'd say. And, and, but there's been a, you know, like you say, there's been a tremendous amount of, of uh, good for the livestock industry mm -hmm. uh, that's come out of this school right. uh, in, the, in the form of good research. And that's above and beyond the fact we've had some really good practitioners and clinicians. Tom, was there some research that uh, lent itself to human uh, medicine in HIV and AIDS? Uh, did we do some research, uh, some work with, uh, in partnership with the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center? I think there was. I don't know much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was there was some, some stuff done there, and I know that there's been some... Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's some things that have been done with the university in general as well as health sciences mm -hmm. through the uh, lab animal facilities that we have here now. Well, Tom, what uh, guys through all the years and all the, the, the different ways you've been associated with Oklahoma State University, uh, what uh, do, do you have some favorite memories of your time at OSU? Well, I, I guess I, I'd have to say that uh, uh, Oklahoma State's been good to me, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. they have. Uh, offer, I've had some opportunities to do some things mm -hmm. that uh, had I just stayed in practice, I, I never would have. Mm -hmm. I've, I've so enjoyed the uh, opportunities to travel to, to Africa mm -hmm. and uh, attending. Uh, they've supported me so much in in, in learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, back uh, not long before I retired, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a meeting of the International Sheep Veterinary Society mm -hmm. in uh, Armadale, Australia. And I got to go over there and then I also got, while I was gone, I went over and visited New Zealand, you know, and I mm -hmm. saw, saw that. And, and, and the opportunity to see these other uh, societies and, and, and how they operate and, mm -hmm. and that's been very helpful to me in teaching small ruminant medicine and surgery because of the, the different aspect and the different way that they do things over there and, and how, it, how it affects our situation in this country. Um, so, so that was that was a good memory and uh, I sure enjoyed my African times. They were, they were really good. Mm -hmm. um, 
I've had some really fun times with the students. They they've been they're challenging. Mm -hmm. They're uh, uh, they're they're sharp. They're they're smart. They they keep you on your toes, and sometimes they they, they mm -hmm. can. They, they, they can almost they could almost swallow you <laughs> they just sink your boat if they wanted to but they're nice and they don't do it so it's uh it, that's I've really enjoyed the teaching aspects I mean, there's some special teachers I mean some special students that stand out in your mind that you're a oh, teacher yeah. mentor to that have gone yeah. on and been successful yeah any names you'd want to throw out there well well I think I think the Du Bois kids uh, mm -hmm. you know Paul the, the original and, mm -hmm. and, and and these boys They've been good in there, and one of them's a wife, and, and uh, uh, Bob Morris was a, was a good kid that I worked with a lot of years that uh, I still have contact with. Uh, a more, more recent one is uh, my neighbor kid that uh, was kind of my boy. I had two girls, and he was my neighbor kid, and he's my boy, Mike Lunsford. He's he's in practice over in Northwest Arkansas now, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, Mike Mike was a really neat he's a really neat young man, mm -hmm. and I've, I've enjoyed him uh, all the way up until we've got I've got I've had a number of them come out here and work for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Suzanne Caruso was uh, in small animal practice over in Tulsa. She was one of my helpers out here on the mm -hmm. farm. Took mm -hmm. care of the llamas while I was gone. And, and Joni Noel helped her some, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've had oh, and Tamra, and, oh gosh, there's been so many. The most recent was Brand mm -hmm. Carpenter and mm -hmm. his sure. wife. They're they're in school now, mm -hmm. and, and just neat kids, you know. They're just 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 so good, and, and they I really enjoy being with them mm -hmm. and working with them. Brand's been a real mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. We were talking about earlier about some of your recognition, some highlights in your career. We're talking about the Norton uh, Standing Teacher Award, your national uh, extension, uh, veterinary extension uh, person of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, other awards or special memories well, you I have? Got a, recognition? I got a recognition from the, uh, from the Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Association, mm -hmm. uh, a special award from them. Uh, I've had. Uh, Retired, the alumni, so the Veterinary Alumni Association mm -hmm. uh, made a special uh, recognition, and uh, uh, oh, there's been a, a number of things. Oh, I, I guess one thing that I, I did enjoy too was uh, I, for two or three two-year terms, I was on the uh, secretary of. Agriculture, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture's advisory board mm. for foreign animal diseases, mm. and I got to go to meetings and, and meet in, in Washington D.C. in that area and and, mm. and visit with uh, other professionals from around the country on that. That was that was a nice thing. Another thing that I got to do, the university allowed me to do, was uh, uh, back in the '80s. I was. Uh, 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 chosen to attend the uh, Plum Island Foreign Animal Disease Diagnosticians course. Mm -hmm. And there's only been two or three veterinarians, I think, from OSU that ever had the ability to do that, the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave me the time off and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and allowed me to go do that, and that, and that, was, a, that, was, a, that was really a highlight. That was a mm -hmm. wonderful thing. Well, I'm sure, Tom, I mean, through the years there's been some frustrations and some disappointments as well. Uh, some of your frustrations. I guess one of the things that uh, I kind of eh, wish I'd had the opportunity to do but under the circumstances, it just didn't work out. I would have liked to, uh, at some point in time, had uh, been able to go on and, and do uh, 
uh, finished my graduate work. I did some graduate work here at OSU. Mm -hmm. I almost, um, almost got a master's in parasitology, and then I got promoted, <laughs> and I couldn't get the degree here. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, I actually looked into uh, uh, going away to to pursue a master's in, in a, or a PhD. And mm -hmm. uh, every time I put my, my pencil to it. I couldn't afford to do it. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those things that mm -hmm. I just, uh, with a family and uh, uh, responsibilities here, I just, it just didn't, mm -hmm. I was better off to, to stay right where I was. And there's been times when I wish I'd been able to go ahead and do that. Uh, the, the university, or maybe it's the state, I don't know, they had a policy there that you couldn't get a degree from if you were a, a, a tenured faculty member, you couldn't get a degree from here. I think that's a little short-sighted. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, does the college at this time today uh, support faculty members in getting advanced degrees? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. they they encourage it. As a matter of fact, advanced degrees or board certification. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was never uh, board certified, and I did not get an advanced degree. And I don't think you could do. I don't think you could go where I'm the way I have gone mm. without the canal. Mm. I, I think that's a, a given. Mm. Uh, I'm not, it's probably okay. Mm. I'm kind of a dinosaur in that mm. respect, but that's all right. Well, you alluded earlier, Tom, to the fact that you've had other opportunities, you went to go other places. Uh, what's kept you at OSU so long? That's a good question. Mm. Uh, I can answer that from several angles. Mm. One, um, I could have gone, I was offered a job as extension veterinarian for the state of Nevada. Uh, there was two things that kept me from going there. One, uh, cost of living was a whole lot higher. Mm -hmm. I was going to get a nice raise in salary, but when I looked at the uh, uh, increased cost of living compared to here, I could sell my house and five acres I had at that time, and mm -hmm. it would bring nearly enough to buy a two-bedroom condo out there. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, it just wasn't feasible. It, you know, economically, it was not. An, uh, it, it would have been a, a step backward, and I didn't feel that at my stage in life I could do that. I think I could have gone to uh, Alabama as their extension veterinarian. I, I just liked Oklahoma better. I was offered a position as a, a veterinarian with USAID, U.S. Agency for International Development, in Washington D.C. It was a two-year appointment. And uh, I just, uh, I just didn't think I wanted to live in Washington D.C. I thought it had been a fantastic opportunity, but I just like Stillwater better. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when I got ready to retire, I had people just ask me, said, "Well, where are you going to move to?" And I said, "Man, I'm going to move to New York. I'm staying right here." <laughs> so, so we, we, we did for a, for a Texan, we made an Okie out of you. You made an Okie out of me, <laughs> and uh, you know they may shoot me in Texas for that, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I like them. And it's, you know, one of the things about Stillwater and, it's, and OSU, you, you've got so many, you've got Oklahoma City and Tulsa, mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got things in the arts, you've got athletics, you've got, you know, you've got all kinds of entertainment things that mm -hmm. you can do, and, and, and we've got good medical facilities, and I've got a lot of good friends here, and mm -hmm. uh, Stillwater's just home. And it's a good place to live, isn't it? a good place to live, and I'm happy being here. Mm -hmm. Um, what, uh, again, from your observation over, you know, many years, uh, what what advice would you give to a current or future faculty member or administrator uh, about how to best advance uh, the mission of the OSU College of, of uh, Veterinary Medicine? Well, I think there's two or three things that could be involved here that, 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 uh, that you've got to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, uh, the primary reason we're here is the students. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've, 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 got, you've got to take care of those kids. Mm -hmm. Make sure that, that they get the right kind of education, the right kind of attention, and, mm -hmm. and the right kind of help. Um, if there's any way you can help them with their tuition thing, I think that's a good deal. and that's. I don't know if you're aware or not, but I established a scholarship to to help with that, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's something that has to be done. Mm 
Uh, I think you have to remember uh, to advance the, 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 the school. You, you got to remember the practitioners out here. Uh, they have a, a integral uh, <coughs> interest in it, and and, uh, and and they're part of what makes it operate and keep it going. Going back to that thing about uh, they they know people that can help the school, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that's very, very important. I don't think you can ever walk away from, from your, your, your base of graduates, alumni, mm -hmm. practitioners in the state. Mm -hmm. And many of the practitioners don't necessarily have to be just OSU alumni. Right. Uh, we get them in here from everywhere, and, and they're all important. Mm -hmm. and, and if we uh, show we care, we show we're interested, I think that uh, we can advance our, our college that way. I'm not a very good person to get involved in politics, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people out here in our graduates that can. Mm -hmm. I know right now we have uh, three representatives in the state house mm -hmm. that are veterinarians, and uh, our relationship with them is certainly not going to hurt us, yeah. and it's important to keep that thing in mind. Um, I, I think from an administrative standpoint, I probably wasn't a very good administrator. Uh, but I think that there's some things that are important there, and, and, and I think a, a really good administrator surrounds him, himself or herself with uh, capable people and then listens to them. Mm -hmm. and, and it'll make life a whole lot easier for them if they do that. Mm -hmm. and, and and let them you know give them give them their head and give them give them the reins to turn loose of the reins and let them let them do their thing is, is if they're good and if they're smart and if they, they if they're capable mm -hmm. um, they're going to make you look really good what areas do you think uh, OSU college veterinary medicine should look to in the future to 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 advance uh, you know the college There's some specific areas we think we should be putting addition if we had additional resources where we should they put go? it mm -hmm. I think one of the things that would be really worthwhile and something that I think we could do a good job I think we're unique in that we have such a broad agricultural base in this state mm -hmm. and we have such a big food animal base in the state that that's one of the places we ought to be pushing um, I realize it's not the most lucrative. I realize it's not the most uh, uh, genteel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, large animal practice is hard, dirty work, yeah. but it's important work. Mm -hmm. And and when you when you look at the fact that we've got literally millions and millions and millions of acres of land in this world that are not capable of producing crops, mm -hmm. but they are capable of producing a high quality protein with livestock. Mm -hmm. And that we need to keep them healthy and alive and gaining, mm -hmm. that we, 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 we can't, we're gonna have to depend on animals mm -hmm. for our production, our, our, our food and fiber in the future and, and we need veterinarians to take care of that and I think with Oklahoma's broad base in that area we could be a center here and that's one of the places I'd like to see us go. Whether that's going to happen or not it's going to be, I, I just don't know, but I think it would be a good place to go. Tom, what, I don't think of in these terms, but what's been your legacy? Do you think over the years? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't guess I ever thought about it much. Uh, hey, you're old enough now. You can be thinking about your legacy. <laughs> I'm definitely old enough. That's, that's for sure. Uh, I guess if I were, you know, I would like to be remembered as a fair, honest, and, and, and practical teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that, that's that's what I, I guess would be what I would like to see mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. And I and I hope it happens. You're uh, <clears throat> and while at the same time you. You've been, a, I'm sure, a wonderful teacher. Your legacy's been even broader than that, Tom. I mean, uh, when you think of your legacy, uh, extension and people's lives you've touched, practitioners, do you, how do you want to be remembered with those people that you work with, alumni, practitioners, general public? Well, I, I'd like yeah, I'd like to be remembered as a as a as a, as a supporter of mm -hmm. our college and and and, and the university, mm -hmm. um, and again someone that was uh, was practical and and, and mm -hmm. uh, open minded mm -hmm. and and would I, I guess one of the things that I did for many years was I carried a lot of ideas from the from the field back to the to the school. Mm -hmm. And I tried to take the information from the school back to the field, and and, and, a, and a purveyor of, of information and and uh, uh, goodwill is yeah, I, I guess is where it would fit in there. That's probably not a good answer, but Tom, what uh, what would what if anything would you change? Years you talked about perhaps getting some graduate degree and in, in, in training. Anything else that you look back and if you had a chance to do it differently, you'd have changed it a little bit? Not much. I think I've had a really, really interesting life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you when you just kind of break it down and looking at the, look at the profession from from what I the part the parts that I've been involved mm -hmm. in. Um, I was a ranch veterinarian for a while. I was a general practitioner for a while. Uh, I was a small animal practitioner for a while. Um, I've been a teacher for a lot of years. I was an extension veterinarian for a lot of years. Um, I was involved in international development in, in for five years. Um, the profession has been very, very good to me, and and I have enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm still involved in it to some degree, but I've moved on to some other things. That, you know, uh, mm -hmm. somebody asked me one time, said, well, well, how can you quit being a veterinarian? I said, well, I guess I was smart enough to learn to be a veterinarian. I can be smart enough to learn to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've enjoyed retirement, and I've enjoyed doing other things and mm -hmm. taking care of my livestock out here through on this little farm. And um, I do woodworking. I enjoy doing that. I enjoy reading, I uh, enjoy learning things still, and, and uh, I really enjoy traveling. We do a lot of that. I don't know if I'd change anything much. You know, I, I, I think it would be, it would have probably been advantageous from a, from a, a career development standpoint to, to have done graduate work or got a board certification. But I might have moved on somewhere and I wouldn't be in Stillwater, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> good. Well, Tom, anything else we haven't covered? Did you, is your chance to kind of share some things with us? Anything that uh, you'd like to add? I guess, I guess one thing that. Uh, Throughout my career, I've had uh, the support of some really, really fantastic folks. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were very supportive in what I wanted to do and, and uh, helped where they could. Uh, going through school, my, my great uncle and my granddad assisted me monetarily to help me get through. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem like much at the time, but it was enough to keep me going, you know, mm -hmm. keep me propped up. Um, my, f my first wife, uh, we were married for 42 years before she died, and and, uh, and she always supported me uh, in everything I did. She, you know, she went to Africa with me twice, and mm -hmm. and my daughters were, were uh, supportive in everything that happened, and Libby has been fantastic in supporting me in the same thing and I, they, I couldn't have done it without these people mm -hmm. and uh, 
I guess I'm, I consider myself probably one of the luckiest guys in the world to uh, have had this many uh, good and strong and supportive folks around me. Mm -hmm. and my four sisters, you know, mm -hmm. they've been supportive on, on mm -hmm. things that I've done. And I've been off up here in Oklahoma, they're all down in Texas, you know, but, but yet they, they mm -hmm. think this is a good deal. And, mm -hmm. Uh, I couldn't have done what I've done without the help of all these folks, that's for sure. Well, Tom, you bring up maybe the question too about support. What about deans? You worked with, gosh, I mean, oh, six, seven, eight yeah, deans or more of your career. One, I think. Huh? Do, you, do, any, any thoughts on any of the deans have been particularly helpful to you that you had a great relationship yeah. with? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Brock mm -hmm. uh, was dean when I went to, to Africa the first time. Mm -hmm. He encouraged me to do it. Mm -hmm. He protected me while I was gone, and he assisted me when I got back. Mm -hmm. he, he was a he. Bill was was involved in our Guatemala project, right. and he uh, was aware of uh, the broadening experience of international work mm -hmm. and and what it could mean to you. And, and, and he really encouraged that and I really appreciated that with him he, he was a he was a real pillar in that respect uh, Pat Morgan's been a friend for years mm -hmm. uh, he and I've worked together on a lot of different things and, and he, he, he he was one that uh, when, I, when I went off on my uh, he was dean when I went off to uh, Arkansas, mm -hmm. to Winter Rock. and then Joe Alexander supported me and, and gave me the opportunity to be one of his uh, uh, deanlets, we referred to it, one of his assistant deans, you know, mm -hmm. or associate deans, and, uh, and, and I think we had a good, uh, had a really good uh, relationship there. I think Joe did a good job of, uh, he, he was a extremely good person to work with with um, mm. fundraising and, and, and people out in the field and he kind of had he kind of did what I talked about a while ago I think he surrounded himself with capable people mm. and he let them run the place mm. and he kind of got out of the way mm. and and uh, and I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. He let me run my shop the way I mm -hmm. thought it ought to be ran, and I think, I think it ran smooth, and I think it did did the things it was set up to do. What What do you think about having one of our own, uh, Dean Michael Lorenz, uh, Michael. Dean College now? <laughs> you probably remember maybe teaching him some classes. Michael right? Lorenz mm -hmm. was one of my students. Mm -hmm. Michael Lorenz was my next door neighbor when he was a senior. Uh -huh. Michael Lorenz helped me very instrumental in helping me save my old Dalmatian dog when she picked up rat poisoning. Uh -huh. uh, strychnine. Mm -hmm. my, Mike's one of the brightest and best I think we've ever produced and mm -hmm. I think he's done a fantastic job and, I, and I, I've been extremely pleased with uh, what he's brought to the college and the way he's handled it. I think he's uh, I think with his experience and other other schools, his experience at Cornell as a grad student in, in, uh, in Georgia and then Kansas State. Uh, I think they prepared him well to come here and do what he's done. And uh, I think he's learned a lot from them and, and uh, has progressed uh, right on up that line. And I, and I see some, I see a, a bright future for us in, in the school. I think it was a good move when he came here and I, I'm pleased with what he's done. As a general rule, I think I've got I've got along with all of the deeds that we've had. The only one we had was and nobody got along with him. He didn't last very long, <laughs> like some years ago. But Brock uh, uh, was good. Uh, uh, Pat was good. Joe has been good, and Mike has been very very good. I just I, I think things have gone pretty smooth. I think we've been fortunate to get these people, and they've all, each brought their own. Oh, their own little uh, differences, their little quirks, their, their little their little part to to build on, and, and, and it's been like it's helped the school. I I guess I'd have to say that uh, 
you know, uh, the profession of veterinary medicine is small, and the number of schools is very small. And when you look in the grand scheme of things, with all of these schools and, and all of these big name schools here, there, and beyond, uh, maybe Oklahoma State College of Veterinary Medicine or Center for Veterinary Health Sciences, as they call it now, maybe we haven't garnered the peak that some of these other schools have in an area. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes down to producing the best practitioners of any place, they were tops. Mm -hmm. I think we're absolutely tops. I think we've produced the best and then the brightest as far as those going out and doing the work of the profession out in, in, in and when you see what they've done and you go back mm -hmm. and you look at at the accomplishments of our graduates and, and, and it's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, this little old school that has not been supported many times as, as well as it could be from an economic standpoint and uh, uh, sometimes we had to just pull our belts in and just really grunt to keep, keep things going. Mm -hmm. And it's done a fantastic job. Great. Anything else? I can't think of anything right over. Appreciate it. Thanks.